On behalf of the partners and staff of Kingwood Madison's, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today for this very special rights talk with the Australian Human Rights Commission. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Claire Warren and I'm a senior associate here at Kingwood Madison's and chair of LINK, our LGBTI inclusion network. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I'd also like to pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the room today. I'd like to warmly welcome our special guest speaker, Casey Legler, along with Australia's Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins. It's fantastic to justice that individuals experience. Addressing inequality and poverty, particularly amongst children and young people in Australia, is the core objective of our community impact program. LINK also aims to engage our collective diversity to ensure an inclusive workplace culture and help bring the firm's priorities to life by championing our extraordinary people and caring for our clients, our communities and each other. Our focus at KWM is to make a sustained, long-term and positive impact on the communities in which we work, live and operate. We do this by partnering with various community organisations around Australia, including the Australian Human Rights Commission, the Human Rights Law Centre, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Service, Equity Australia, uh, sorry, Equality Australia, the Smith Family and Youth Law Australia, amongst others. We are very proud of our long-standing community partnership with the AHRC and the pro bono work we do for them. We are honoured to be able to host this rights talk today. From all of the King and Wood Madison's partners and staff, thank you for taking the time to be here and for recognising the significance that today plays in the continued quest to build a society where every person, regardless of race, religion, colour, gender expression or identity, or any other status, is inherently entitled to equal rights as a human being. Thank you. Hello, and I'm Kate Jenkins, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, and I'm also very privileged to be up here with our fantastic guest speaker. I will also start by acknowledging the traditional owners, I can hear myself, the traditional owners, the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And particularly when you look out at this view, you realise what a beautiful land mass this is and what an amazing place to live for thousands of years. Um, also acknowledging, thank you, there are a number of Australian Human Rights Commission staff here, including our fantastic CEO, Padma Rahman, up the front. Um, I appreciate your supporting being here and I know you're just as excited as I am to hear Casey speaking. And thanks also, Claire, to King and Wood Mellisons um, for hosting this event and also other support that you give the Human Rights Commission. And welcome everyone who is here today. Um, most importantly, welcome and thanks to Casey for coming along today. 
So I first met Casey in 2018. Uh, I caught up with her because she is married to LGBTI favourite Australian activist, Siri May, who is here today. Um, and also <laughs> just all round legend. And her, um, her partner, we found out when Natasha and I were in New York, was a restaurateur at a new fabulous uh, French restaurant in which part of I can't so in Soho. So 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 cool. We uh, went to this restaurant, uh, but didn't get to meet. I think Casey had been working all the night before, and we didn't get to meet Casey. So when I did meet Casey, I thought I'm really interested in what's the career path to becoming a restaurateur. And anyone who's here today will realise it's a very unusual career path uh, if you're Casey. So we're excited that uh, what an amazing life she has had. And that career path, I think, involves uh, Olympic swimming, some drug dealing, some, uh, some male modelling, uh, art, being an artist. Uh, what else am I forgetting? An author now. Uh, what else have I forgotten? You're going to tell us all. <laughs> it's a very diverse, that's pretty good. It's a very diverse um, and really fascinating career. And when I met Casey, what I did know straight away is Casey is one of the most magnetic and fascinating people on this planet. And so what a great joy that Casey's written a book for us, but also, even more importantly, is here to talk to us today. So I'm really excited to hear we're going to follow a format which is less of a lecture and more of a conversation between us with help from you. In terms of questions you might have, we'll take those into account in how we have our conversation. I'm really interested in Casey sharing her story and particularly, I guess, um, from the Human Rights Commission and particularly the work I've been doing in sport, uh, it, it was a really starting fascination when Casey said she'd been an Olympic swimmer and described some of her experiences. So at the Human Rights Commission, we know sport is a human right. And yet, because of our view about gender roles uh, and the challenges particularly that female athletes have, identify as gender diverse, uh, as non-binary or even transgender to participate in sport. So we're really uh, focusing some of, on some of that work at the Commission and having Casey here was a really great opportunity to have that as part of the conversation but also to hear more about you. Yeah. So can I hand over to you? Yeah, this totally. <coughs> Is this working? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so. First of all, it's really so lovely to be here. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, which is really lovely. Thanks for taking the time out of your day. Um, and I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and owners of the land. And like Kate said, when we look out here, um, something I'm quite enamored by. So I'm really grateful for that. And thank you for having me. Um, <coughs> kind of talking about how we were going to do the format and we realized maybe like five minutes out that neither one of us really knew what format we were going to do. So um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a little bit from the book um, and then, because um, I'm actually very curious, I mean like Kate said, like my life uh, has spanned multiple lives, I feel, and I'm tired and um, <laughs> I'm 42. And, uh, but, um, but I really do, there's so many aspects of the book, I think, that cross gender, that also cross um, self-harm, that cross what it meant to have been a young girl in the 90s. There's also an amazing soundtrack in the book, so if you guys have questions about music, I welcome those as well. Um, but, you know, I think that what I'm mostly interested in in this particular format today is actually taking a few questions at a time and then um, answering them and kind of weaving the conversation about me and um, what I do now, but also what it was like and um, how I've ended up 21 years later in this seat alive and well and fulfilled and well-loved and um, intact with my capacity to love intact, um, which I think is ultimately what a part of this story is about, um, is about this young teenage girl who basically just crawled her way out of 
um, her life into her 20s until, um, until I got clean. What's very cool about being here right now today, um, we're still in April, but the book ends April 23rd, 1998. And so it feels really special that there's like some timing around that. I'm on the spectrum, so sometimes I'll really go into numbers. Forgive me, I'll be like a Siri, and she'll be like, "You said too many numbers." <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but um, you know, it was 21 years ago, um, April 23rd, that when this book ends, when um, truly uh, I was given um, what I like to think is a, an absolute gift and inexplicable in many ways, um, a second chance to just kind of remain alive and intact. Um, so I'll read and then we'll just go from yeah. there, right? Okay, cool. Um, so I'll, I feel like the first part of the, um, the first chapter, um, so this book's divided into three, um, and this is from the beginning Genesis, and um, Winter 1991 in Stockholm, Sweden, and this was maybe like my third um, travel trip with the international French team. I was 14, um, so drinking pretty um, happily and consistently and aggressively um, for two years already. Um, and this is this place I feel like encapsulates my my experience really well. Um, winter 1991, Stockholm, Sweden. My eyeballs wake up sighing. I'm in bed and don't move. One blank. 14. I'm 14, I say to no one. Light filters through every small square weave of the thick industrial orange hotel curtains. I turn my head away from them and stare at the ceiling. I'm stuck on another team trip. It's 7 a.m. The only alarm clock in the hotel is the television set to MTV, and the music that woke us and that's playing right now sucks. My roommate gets up to brush her teeth, and I hear her pajamas walk into the bathroom. I hate her. I look back to the window. The music changes, and I lift my head from its pillow and stare at the screen. Without taking my eyes off the TV, I reach for the remote next to my bed and turn up the volume. I can hear my teammates down the hall doing the same. They're opening their hotel room doors to let the sound out, and I hear it seep into the hallway carpet, and now my whole body sits up and I watch it. Anarchic cheerleaders slowly moving back and forth like they're underwater, arching their backs in a slow motion dirty school gym, their hair waving rhythm from their long necks down to their tight waists. The boys in loose jeans, t-shirts and sneakers on bleachers and head banging a slow moving mosh pit. And those four notes I've never heard before are playing over and over and over again. I'm seeing my people. I'm seeing home, Nirvana. My brain clicks, my eyes tunnel to the gym in front of me and I hear it from far away, background noises to my sentences. I have to swim today, I'm at a swim meet. I'm wearing sweatpants. Through the sound, I look down at my arms and I can't believe they're mine fast and quick. I flex a muscle in my forearm without thinking and stare at it, flexing, unflexing. I have to wait until tonight to smoke. I have to wait until tonight to drink. Teen spirit lands on all of me and the cheerleaders arch their backs and show off their tight tits and my back slouches toward them, hungry from under its t-shirt. My arm drops to its side and my body howls, music, arm, tits on a television and I have to stand it while it does, blank. I look back up to the screen and what I want is to make the fact that I'm not them go away. I want to be in there somewhere, not mine, like them, headbanging away the hollow from the inside. Stockholm clicks back into focus, silence. I turn my head and stare with disgust at my roommate who's just come out of the bathroom. She has a toothbrush in her mouth and white toothpaste on her lips. She's staring at the television too. So welcome to my teenage years. <laughs> I was so intense. And, um, and part of what was 
beautiful and also painful about writing this book was the intensity with which I um, made the choice to stay true with. And I think that I ask a lot of the reader because it is um, uh, incessant, it is endemic, um, I don't let up. And at times, with my editor, we talked about it, um, this violence on the body, this uh, imprisonment, this cage that I lived in as a young kid. You know, I look at 14-year-olds now, and I just am like, what? Like, you know, a lot of people have asked me, like, where were, where were the adults? And, um, you know, that's, that's something that we can, we can definitely talk about. But um, I'll read one last passage, because it, um, it also talks about what it was like for me to swim. Um, and I do think that swimming saved my life. I think that if I hadn't been swimming, I probably would have ended up on the streets much sooner than I did. Um, and it took me many years to kind of come to terms with that. And I have a funny story about that. So my mentor, it's a little bit of a segue, and then I'll go to the story, and I won't take the question. But um, so I got <clears throat> I got sober, and um, I'm 20, and uh, it's three days before I turn 21, and I'm basically feral, right? Like I don't have the thing that is uh, helping me stay alive anymore, which was alcohol. And drugs, you know, I did, I did, I did my fair share of dry goods, and uh, and uh, and so, um, but I also was so irreverent. Like I just basically figured I was doing everyone a favor, you know, like by showing up to practice. I was like, listen, I hate what I'm doing, uh, but I'm swimming fast, and so you're even, you're just lucky that I'm here. Which are things that I've actually said to my coaches, and I talk about a few instances in the book. But I was like, you know, would tell my coaches like, listen. You, what do you want me to say? Like, you don't have a job without me. And he, like, lunged. <laughs> and, uh, and so so I get sober, and nothing has changed outside of the fact that now I'm no longer intoxicated with an attitude. And uh, so I show up to my mentor, and she's like, okay, so, you know, we're going to meet at this time. She's been connected to me by uh, another woman, um, you know, bless the women, the elders who kind of carried me through my first, um, my 20s, basically. And you continue to be um, my my anchors and my you know like just um, I feel so lucky. But uh, anyway, she said so. We're gonna meet at this place, you know, ten o'clock. We'll have coffee. I'm like cool. And anyway, I roll up at like ten twenty, and this is a high level executive at the Freedom House, which you know is this big nonprofit in the states. And um, she's sitting across from me, and I sit down, and I'm like, cool, like, I'm here, no worries, like, 20 minutes late, whatever. And um, the first thing she says is she says, I have better things to do than to wait around for you. And I was shocked. I was like, it had never occurred to me that um, I was wasting people's time. Uh, so uh, she taught me about entitlement in that first hour. She taught me about um, how... Uh, it, you know, what had kept me alive, that irreverence, was now no longer applicable. And that if I wanted to show up for life in a way that was going to work and be a kind of worker among workers, um, the first thing I had to learn how to do was show up on time. And it took me years. I was like, I mean, I really, anyway. So, <laughs> now I show up on time. It's been like a decade since I've been there. Everybody actually that I know now will be like, yeah, Casey shows up on time, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> so, um, I'll read this last page and then we'll go from there. Yeah, cool, okay. Um, okay. Uh, coach gathers us in front of the dry erase board, and we can see our practice written up there for the night. It's all endurance work. Long, long sets of fucking nothing. My sigh resigns itself to the workout and shoulders slump. I turn around to face my lane in the water and the far off wall at the other end of it. I try to hope that it'll be one of those practices where my brain lifts out of my body and I can't tell I'm swimming. I doubt it. It's going to hurt and I'm going to have to try. I snap on my swim cap like a habit and consider the set of 200s while everyone talks around me. 
My toes curl over the edge of the pool. I know I have at least the month to warm up before I have to worry about how I'm going to get through this. I wonder how I'll swim tonight, fast or slow. I don't really know anymore, either one being as accidental as the other. I breathe out and bend over the water, arms hanging loose, a pendulum swaying back and forth. I get ready to feel the cold. I know the first second will burn. It does every time. I dive in. The water bristles the length of my body and moves the hairs on my arms to under my armpits and down my thighs. She licks her cold, open mouth down my shins to my upturned toes. I kick her silently to the bottom tiles. My arms slowly float from out in front of me down to my sides where my hands limp behind me, fluttering up and down like butterfly wings on my hips. Bubbles whirl millions of small and large translucent circle lines out of my nose, and my eyeballs watch each tile pass by, my nose so close it almost grazes each one of them. I move my black shadow over the bottom with long, slow dolphin kicks. The water looks like the blue ocean down here. I pull my arms up to my shoulders slowly and touch the tiles passing them underneath the skin at the edges of my fingertips, and I float forward over them. I slow down to a stop under here and gently curl up my legs to my chest. I'm a cocoon. I'm an embryo. I am this. I close my eyes and the light shimmers around me. I bow my head, ready to press my whole body to the surface. I explode out in one long rise above the surface, and my arm moves like a whale over its body for her first stroke. I have breached. That's it. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah, can I go first? <laughs> yeah. And then what we will do is we're going to sort of, it's not going to be a conventional Q&A, um, but we will get a sense of what the questions are in the room. But I mean, what a privilege to have you read both of those passages. I, and this will, this is not a book, we're not the Sydney Writers Festival and I'm not <clears throat> an expert on writing, but I do, I, I have read it, it is an amazing book. So, and, and I'd encourage people to read it, but you, you are, um, we're interested in getting extra stories yeah. because we know we can read those. But I guess the one thing I will say is having read it and knowing that when I go away and I write a diary, it's and then I got up and then I did this and then I did that. You've read some of the pieces of what you've written. I'm curious about how it's not just documenting the story of struggle. It's a beautifully written book. Mm -hmm. um, did you have that, like how did you, where was that in you? Have you, um, like how did you become an author yeah. out of all these things? Where did you get those words? Because my sense of reading it wasn't just, it's not just what you tell us about how you write it, kind of gets the sense of what it was, was like to be in that chaos. Where did the writer come from in you? So I've been writing since I was eight. Uh, probably six, six, six or seven. When I was eight, I made uh, our local newspaper. <laughs> we, <laughs> it was a one-page black and white uh, story about the rabbit that we had at the time. And um, we had five ducks who lived in the swamps in Louisiana. And we also caught an alligator that week as well. So those were like the three, the three big stories. And. Um, <laughs> And I formatted it, and I had, took pictures, and I uh, collaged it. This is, I mean, there's some of you who don't even know what a photocopying machine is anymore because everything's so digital. But I paint, you know, scotch tape. <laughs> I was going to make a scotch tape joke, but do whatever. Uh, scotch tape, and then I uh, printed it, and then I distributed it onto this street where we, um, where we lived, because we lived in one street in Louisiana. So writing has always been a part of my life. Um, and growing up, especially during this time, I found such comfort in books. Like, they saved my life. Books and music um, were such a... Um, they were my comfort. Uh, I read everything. And by the time I'm a teenager, I am 
Finally, uh, you know, 13, 14, I uh, got my hands on Proust, I got my hands on Kafka, which was amazing, because Kafka in Metamorphosis and the Trial was finally putting words to the absurdity that I felt I was experiencing. I truly did not understand why the adults around me were behaving the way that they did. Um, I didn't understand why no one else uh, kind of was getting the memo that we were just swimming back and forth in a pool and that this wasn't like this was that's all that was happening. Like I just I didn't like I didn't understand like this enthusiasm around sports and I was like we are literally just swimming to one end and back. And so when I when I read Kafka. I was like, this guy, this dude gets it, and he's like, so waiting for Godot, I really identified with as well. So I was like a very profound, very precocious reader. Um, and so all of these guys are dudes, right? So I also read, um, you know, Leaving Las Vegas and um, Naked Lunch, and there was a canon there about what it meant to be and grow up in boyhood, you know, with that irreverence and with that grit and with that um, kind of creativity. And these authors um, used a creative license around syntax and grammar and language and like really got into it and created these like totally psychedelic stories about boys. And I was like, I'm, I'm sick of it um, because the girls that I ran with were tough as nails, right? Like for every guy who has a story out there, there's some girl who's like in it, right? And uh, so I was so uh, so that's this that is the lineage that I was interested in um, kind of you know bringing on a little bit. I was like, okay, cool. Like I'm you know you throw them down. Like here, here's that. You know, like I'm just gonna. So um so part of it was um so in that sense it was very exciting. But I also had to find a way to like I said, um, you know the the content is really brutal um, and. I had to, you know, in many ways, write poetry so that the reader could come along on on that. Yeah. yeah. So the other, just from the two passages that you've read, and also the start of the book. At the start of the book, that you say, after I wrote this, I got yeah. a diagnosis of autism. Yeah. And we've just in Melbourne had the Melbourne Comedy Festival and Hannah Gatsby has done her new Love show. Yeah. And Hannah, in that show, without being a spoiler alert, said before she did her Nanette show, she also got a, a, a diagnosis of yeah. autism. Uh, and this show, she talks about it, but she particularly talks about how helpful it would have been to understand and know that about herself. That there was a lot of her history where she 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 didn't understand why she didn't fit in. Yeah. And, uh, so I'm interested when you talk about the swimming and that how you see the world, has that um, diagnosis, how does that made you reflect? What Hannah kind of says is it would have been really helpful if I knew this earlier. Yeah. Um, but any reflections you've got on Yeah, that? I mean, I have a funny anecdote. Siri totally knows what I'm going to say, this is the story. But so I was, I was diagnosed after, um, my wife's name is Siri, by the way. I'm not talking about the phone. <laughs> I realized I, like, I should say that. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah, Siri, Siri knows, knows well. everything. Um, so, uh, I was, I wrote this book, and um, my publisher was like, okay, this is wild, like, what is happening here? And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I also just found out I'm on the, I was a lot more reluctant as well. I was like, my first reaction to everything is like, it's none of your business. And um, I also told my agent when I finished writing this book that I wasn't going to do any interviews, and he's like, okay, <laughs> we'll work on that, we'll work on that. Um, but, uh, so he said, um, so I, I said, you know, I was diagnosed with being on the autism spectrum. And um, so in many ways, my experience of light and sound is not different than what it was in when I was a kid. It, I have a wider brain. I have a lot more coping skills. I understand, you know, the benefit of being born a young girl is that um, the autism manifests a little differently in young boys than it does in young girls. And we're excellent mimickers. So we actually go around undiagnosed and really lonely. Like we seem to be fitting in, but we're, um, you know, extraordinarily stressed. And, um, and we're basically just like, okay, that person has just done that. So we just kind of like follow the cues. So it can be quite stressful. 
Um, so yeah, of course it would have been really helpful to have that, but I mean, I feel like it would have been, there's so many things, like, I don't know, like a caring adult would have been really helpful. Yeah. Like, that, I could have done yeah. that. That would yeah. be cool. Yeah. Like, just start there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but, um, but when I was diagnosed, it was actually, so I have more of a, like, contemporary experience with it. I was diagnosed, and I, I was really relieved, because up until that point, I thought everything was wrong with you. Um, so I, I didn't understand you all. Right. I was like, I don't know. But I, I did. I, you know, I was, um, you know, I think it's this myth that, like, as people who are on the spectrum, we're, like, not attached to people. It's because we really are. We're, you know, really compelled by you people. But, you know, like, um, and, uh, and then really committed and, and curious, but oftentimes, or less so now, but certainly when I was a kid, I didn't understand what was going on, but I had such fondness for my friends that I was kind of willing to just go along with whatever was happening. Um, but as an adult, what I experienced was a sense of relief. I was like, oh, okay, nothing is wrong with these people. Um, like, they're actually, I am the one that can be a little bit um, uh, uh, different about stuff. It's not that there's wrong with anyone. That's just how you're operating. Oh, my God, yeah, it's totally. Yeah, yeah. So the, the last thing, just because you've said it, is there anything else you want to say about the absence of adults? Because that was really clear to me as a mother. You were 12, you were 14. And I was like, how is no one kind of interacting? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we were left alone a lot of the time. Uh, we're, I'm 14, I'm on international training trips, and we, you know, it's not like they have an adult for every swimmer. Like, it's not a one, it's not even a one to three ratio, right? Like, it just, um, which I think is what an ideal classroom setting is, it's like one to three. We were, like, oftentimes, like, 10, 12, 13 to one. We had five coaches, and about... 35 to 40 swimmers, all between the ages of 14 and 16. And where were your mom and dad? Well, they, you know, I met these swim meets, so they're, they're what, yeah, they're just at home. I also, you know, my mom and my dad were, you know, for all of their challenges, they also had five kids, you know, and um, they, I have a, a lovely relationship with my mom today that is, you know, very adult. And um, but my father has now passed. But it was just kind of like I wasn't even um, angry or resentful at them because it was just always what it was like. There, you know, we're one of five. I raised my little siblings. Like it was just kind of how it was. And then when it became a part of a coaching environment, it was just the same thing. But what I will say, though, and what I think is important to talk about, or certainly what I'm curious about talking about today, is just that, because I, I, you know, I've been out of sports for 20 years now, and um, there was just this um, really uh, curious, um, like, complete control over some aspects of my life, from what I ate, to where I showed up, to what I studied, even limitations around what I could pursue in school, and then total neglect. Um, so I think that that kind of juxtaposition of like uh, intense delivery of two opposite things was probably, you know, I mean, we were kids, we really just did what we what we could, but we were left unattended. Um, the last thing I'll say is that when I did finish writing this book, my publisher said the same thing. He was like, where are all the adults? Because actually, there were no adults in the first version of the book. It was like uh, peanuts, like wah, 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 wah. And uh, he was like, you can't, I, he didn't say you can't do this. I was like, well, I, I actually didn't even realize that I hadn't written any adults into the book because they just really, yeah. When they were there, they were either um, perpetrators or um, just looked the other way, or, and were also like themselves in their late twenties, early thirties, as like high-level coaches doing their thing. Yeah. yeah. 
and there's a real conversation in Australia and many of you will know we have a National Children's Commissioner and Human Rights Commission who's so been good. in place for eight years and that a lot of what you're describing is what her job is about, the conversation about institutional mistreatment of children, about what we can do to make particularly sport. It's yeah. a very big conversation about making sport safe for kids as a place that they can Yeah. And I, mean, I guess then I want to go to questions, but the last thing I'll say about that, and we've had many conversations about this, is just this notion that, like, is there a best practice of care around professional athletes when those athletes are so young, but also inherent in being a professional athlete is pushing yourself to a physical, painful extreme. Like, that's the point of being a professional athlete. And can you, as a coach, be caring uh, when that is the given of what being a professional athlete is? So I, 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 I don't know. We, we, you know we and, and at the Human Rights Commission, we would say, yes, you can still be yeah. elite and observe people's human rights. So what we're going to do now is, um, that, that is the faith. That's that, no, I believe, I mean, I, yeah, I, think that, I think that that's true. And certainly if I was a coach, I would feel like that's possible, but I just am like, what if, you know, yeah, yeah, we've had some yeah. stories that have told us that's yeah. not happening. So what we're gonna do, because we've still got sort of 20 plus minutes, yeah. is we are not going to do one-on-one -on -one Q and A. What we're going to do is we've got some mics in the room. Mm -hmm. We are going to um, just get people around the room to either put, in a pretty short way, we're going to take a number of <coughs> questions or comments or I would like to hear more about. Because basically for the next 20 minutes, um, my mission is to just hear some more great stories from Casey and we know there's a huge reservoir there, but we want to make a match what you might be interested in. So can I just have a show of hands of anyone who has a question um, and uh, things that you would want to hear about? Like topics, really anything. <laughs> yes. One, two, three. Cool. So I'm just that? waiting for the mic, please. Yes. Just, <laughs> there's one now. Hi. I was really interested in your journey around your identity. Well, yeah. True question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's other ones. There's one. I can see you. Yeah, that's related to the first question, which is um, it, the journey and the discrimination that you may have felt uh, growing up. Cool. So there's one. Just one more. Okay. Okay. Oh, you more books. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I guess I'll just start with Rem. Do you want to just do one, one more question? Yeah, you talk about your influences, like who you used to read. And I think it reads like Camus or yeah. Hunter S. Thompson, with this really like wild side to it. Um, I just want to know how have people responded to that? Have you been given that sort of creative reference, you know, as, as someone who's not a man? Hmm. That's a great one. Uh, okay. And then, and then, can you just, just out of curiosity, can you throw in how the heck you ended up being a male model? <laughs> so that's just, just, I'm just very good looking. <laughs> <laughs> you are, you're gorgeous. <laughs> um, I don't know. Very modest. <laughs> very modest. Um, okay, cool. So, so um, uh, so I moved to New York in 2009 and was a, a visual artist and I very quickly had to move from like very big um, things to very small tiny things because anyone who's been in New York it's like my apartment was the size of this chair and uh, so I had to figure out things to do digitally um, so writing or anything like that. Um, writing, I also did a lot of video work around the body. I've always been curious about the body. I think that's just because I was an athlete. So just that, that curiosity around objectification, around what it means to have been born a woman or a girl, what it means to be biologically female, what that has looked like around my journey, around my own identity, which I will get to. Um, so all of these things were things I was super curious about and I, in New York, um, 
became friends with a lot of other art practitioners. And some of them had questions about you know, curiosities around what it meant to represent the body. A lot of them were photographers. And there was this one photographer who, um, and I always said no. You know, people often wanted to take pictures of me or ask me if I was a model, particularly when I was younger. I do have a sidebar story that's <coughs> hilarious and not in the book, which I will Wait, share that's what we now. Yeah. So, and it's about my gender identity as well. So I didn't, I will get back to that. I'm just going to keep looking at your question because you're going to be the end point. And um, so when I was uh, 17, I had really, really long black hair. It was the era of the crow. Does anyone remember the crow? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, I see some, some wide grins down there. Shanti! Stop! <laughs> She's here. Um, and uh, so I had really, really long hair, and I dyed it black, and I had like a big undercut, and uh, I wore like really big uh, silver, like jewelry, whatever, and like long black flowing. And I, and I also went through a period of like doing like the crow um, makeup, like that. <laughs> I looked amazing. And, uh, and um, I qualified for the Olympics, and Pantene is like, this is amazing, we're gonna, um, keep you, we're gonna, we'd like to give you a contract. And I'm like, amazing. And then I go and shave my head. So the contract <laughs> went away. Um, but, so the sidebar to that was modeling. modeling right. That was the only time that I said I would do it, that I would, that I would agree to do this. Many years go by, you know, basically 10 and 15, and um, I'm 31, and my friend uh, says, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing this uh, magazine story. She's kind of a very well-known fashion photographer, but it's a story about, um, a, story about a boy gang, and, but I don't want to use boys. I just want to use, like, you know, us. And so I say, sure, I'll do it. And at the end of it, uh, she said, you know, I think that you could do this. And, um, and I had literally that week said I would say yes to everything. <laughs> and so I said yes. And I remember thinking, why, why this week did I decide to say yes to everything? Because my first answer to everything is, based, is pretty much no. I'm getting a lot better and I'm like more fluid around that. But... Um, and so that's how that, that is how that started. And initially, modeling was very stressful and complicated because the reason that I decided to do it is I felt that, you know, from an active, I came up as a young activist. I got sober and immediately came out and was like, okay, everything is explained. I understand now. I understand everything. And, um, and, uh, and you know, Shaved my head, only wore men's clothes, had like piercings all over my face because it was late 90s. And um, like that was just the thing. Like that was just the thing. And um, fast forward to 12 years later, it wasn't, I felt like there was a, a potential um, usefulness to me stepping into that public mainstream space. And um, so I did, and it was hard because I would show up to these photo shoots and they would have, they would try to put me in women's clothes and I would have to explain to them that um, I was not going to look like what they wanted, what they wanted. Like if they, and I'd also learn to not put anything on or stand in front of the camera because then any photo that they took, they could use. So, which was an interesting exercise, right? Because I came from this background of like being really interested around like, is there agency around getting your photo taken in the body? And what if that photographer is a man? What does it change if that photographer is a woman? Does it change if you are the one taking the photograph of yourself? And um, so it was, quite, it was quite stressful. Like that era was actually very, um, I think, was very stressful because I, I knew that I was um, adding to the lineage, but in a very mainstream way. I stood on the shoulders of giants, um, 
but I was giving language that up until that point hadn't existed on like ABC here or hadn't existed in this in this way that didn't necessarily have to do with being queer but had to do with just being um, different and that that was okay like it had stepped away from sexuality and was just more about Yes. I mean, I could talk a lot about like the different strategies that I was using as an activist in those spaces, but um, but that was that. So my own gender. So I um, so when I was swimming, I I did not know anything about being gay. I thought that you just made out with girls and guys. Like I didn't, I didn't. There was no kind of like anxiety around that stuff until I went to the states. Um, and when I went to the states and made out with the girl who's in the book, um, I just remember feeling such a profound amount of shame, mostly because of how everyone else around me had reacted. Um, and I didn't know, I didn't know about dykes, I didn't know about lesbians, I didn't know about gay men, like I just, there was no, so there, so that was freeing in a way because there was no anxiety about it. Um, but I think that, you know, when we talk about what would have been useful to know, I really think that it would have been great for me to know that I was gay. Like, I just, and you know, there's like some humor in that, but I wish that, because I wasn't the only one that was the way that I am on my swim team, you know, like I can think about uh, you know, five other swimmers, five other girls and a couple of guys who now looking back, I think it would have been, I just don't, we weren't even homophobic necessarily on the team. There just wasn't any, like it was an absence of the words that helped us understand who we were. I got sober and like literally the same day was like, oh my God, I'm so fucking gay. And, uh, <laughs> And then, um, you know, and I have been on my own journey around my own identity. You know, I was born a young girl, and this story is a story about growing up in girlhood. And, um, you know, I pass as a dude most of the time. And, um, and I don't, um, you know, sometimes if it's like I'm not up to it, I go into the women's bathroom, but that's just because I know that I can like just like get in and out of there and like maybe sometime, but like I don't really ultimately belong there, right? And I'm very grateful to the women who just kind of let me slip in and slip out. Um, Cause just, I just, you know, at one point didn't want to learn how to go to the bathroom in the men's bathroom. Like I was just like, I'm tired. <laughs> Like I don't, you know, like I didn't understand the geography and a really good close friend of mine, Brad, he pointed out to me, he's like, so it's the same, just the inverse. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, it's the same. There's nothing different that happened. Like it's got stalls, there are urinals, and it's like, but there's tiles on the floor and there's walls and ceilings and like it's, there are doors. And I, was, I don't know what I thought happened in there, but I, was, I thought that was very reassuring. Um, so, so what, um, you know, I don't, uh, obviously you can say I don't feel very comfortable talking about my own identity in a public space, um, but I, it's a question that keeps coming up, so I feel like it's um, important for me to talk about it, um, especially if there are fellows out me in the world who don't really fit into either space, particularly if they're young people. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's... Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I am happy to talk about it here. I feel like I'm in friendly territory, but um, yeah. yeah. Let's do one more round of questions, if there's any more questions. Um, I've got a million, you know, here, but um, any more questions? There's one back there. One, two. Um, I am writing another book, though. To, oh, yes. To Tell that. that. Yeah, right. Definitely, because a lot of people ask me. They're like, "So what? Like, are like what happened between yes, <laughs> between that last day of using and now? What happened?" So I am writing that book, and it's called "Nevada Is the Bigger Memory," and it's about a complex inheritance of masculinity. Well, the older you get, your opinions change. Yeah, true. And if you're going to write a book about a changed opinion, yeah, it'd be very interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I think that there's a mic back there. Yes. Hi, Casey. Um, Hi. 
In, in your uh, talk, you said that when swimming was the thing that kept you off the streets, that you would have been on the streets earlier yeah. had you not been a swimmer. So what, what was going on in your life that meant that you would have, that you weren't able to be at home mm. and end up on this? And I'm mm. assuming from what you said that at some point you were. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. And one thing. Hi, Kizzy. Um, if you feel that you can, can you talk a bit about your recovery story? Sure. And also about being an artist mm -hmm. and how that's evolved. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Any others? There's one more at the back. Is that, sorry, I'm making you Casey, I'd be interested in how you see the relationship between your artistic creative self and your athletic self. Is there a, a balance or was there a, did they, you know, you talked earlier, you have been a voracious reader and probably had to be kicked out of the library or mm. somebody came in and turned their lights off at night. That relationship between creative and the athletic. Mm. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was a point of stress, actually. Um, I um, it wasn't encouraged um, to even be an academic and an athlete or interested in school and an athlete. Uh, it was discouraged institutionally, it was discouraged by my uh, coaches, and it was discouraged by my teammates. Um, I was definitely an anomaly. And I picked my university based on the coach because he was a painter and I felt that perhaps in him I would be able to find a solution to this very real and very distressing experience I was having about um, not being able to reconcile being an athlete at such a high level and a genuine curiosity and already a young kind of burgeoning work practice. Um, I do think it's possible now, but at the time it was a total mystery and a definite point of um, distress, for sure. Um, and loneliness, actually. Uh, the um, identification with um, uh, swimming saving my life. Um, so I don't, I don't think there was anything in particular. Look, everything was happening to me, you know? I uh, am a survivor, um, I'm a trauma survivor. Uh, none of the adults around me um, were particularly interested in protecting me in any um, useful way. Um, some, just simply because of their own lives, I've come to understand that that is the case, that some adults simply cannot protect the young ones around them. Um, and, but none of it was like one event. Um, I think it was just more this pervasive um, loneliness that I was experiencing as the kid that I was, being on the spectrum, and also just being a young addict and alcoholic. If I had, um, and I'm really grateful that I'm on the spectrum, because for many years I did not understand why I continued to swim, why I continued to swim, why I continued to do this sport that I really hated. Um, and that was so physically aggressive to me in my experience. And one thing that um, is, is known certainly about my autism is that once there's a pattern that's established, it becomes very difficult for me to deviate from that, from that pattern and literally from the path to the pool. Um, and I talk about walking by um, these kids who were homeless, who were on the street in the book, and. I identified with their freedom. I, want, I wanted what I was seeing as freedom. I wanted, um, I also ultimately wanted the ability to just get as high as I wanted all the time. And swimming created for a long time, until I was 18 or 19, uh, an impossibility around that. And, and so that's, that is what I mean by, um, by just, by, by swimming literally saving my life. I, I do absolutely believe that. And as soon when I got sober, it was one of the first things that I um, that I was able to acknowledge with the help of um with the help of a mentor. Um, and uh, in terms of getting sober, so um, you know, I've gotten sober a specific way and I appreciate your question and your discretion. It's much um it's very well put. Um, I you know, I think that there are um, many different ways of getting sober, and um, mine in particular is, um, I'm happy to talk about it on a one-on-one -on -one personal basis, um, but, um, you know, I don't know who's in the room, there might be someone here with um, 
particular problem or curiosity or identification with some of the struggles that I had in the book. And um, you know, there are 12-step programs, there are therapists, there are, um, in the United States, I don't know how it works here, but there are um, detoxes, like there's so many more resources um, now than there were when I was um, when I was young and finally kicked. I did go into rehab as well. That obviously was not successful um, because I drank when I was in rehab, which was amazing uh, because I was able to learn that like truly I had a problem, that like normal people didn't normal people didn't drink in rehab. Like yeah, you know, it just yeah, that was not the case. So yeah. I, I hope that answers the, the questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm just mindful of the time. Yeah. I would happily sit here and listen to you all day. Um, but I will take this moment to um, finish this session. Thank you so much, Casey, yeah. for it's been such a privilege to hear you speak. You are really doing something that all of us have a real struggle with, which is talking deeply and intimately about yourself. And we know the incredible generosity that you're showing in doing that. Um, because it matters, it makes a difference to so many people that you're able to share this story. So adding to all of your sort of careers underneath it all is your ability to communicate is amazing and we really appreciate. So on behalf of everyone here, I just wanted to thank you for giving us your time.